Well, Thank let's get started. Hi, everybody. Hi. So our second show uh, on Franz Liszt's music, and um, I spent half half the show um, with transcriptions of other composers, mainly Schubert songs. And as I said in the show, he um, transcribed quite a bit of Schubert songs uh, throughout the course of his life. Uh, but especially in this period when he when he did these transcriptions, which is around 1838, 1839. Um, whoa, hold on, We're many people trying to get in here. So, so Liszt, you know, it's a, and, and it's a criticism of Liszt in his, in his compositions where he's, he doesn't write a lot of original compositions, really transcriptions and, and all these fantasies and things take up a very, very large portion um, of his repertoire. But at the beginning of the show, I got a little bit into the, his performing um, phenomenon and this uh, Listomania. Uh, which uh, there's, it's funny, I, I stumbled upon a musicologist and I don't remember um, the man's name, but he said it was nothing like, Beatlemania was nothing like Listomania because Listomania was described as an illness. <laughs> so it wasn't sort of this, you know, matic uh, response to him. But, um, you know, List, it was, you know, obviously he was a magnetic performer through his sheer skill of performing. But he was a little bit of a self-promoter too. He really knew how to work a crowd, and he could, you know, and and as I said in the in the um in the show, like he, like he would sometimes not show up on stage for a half hour after he was supposed to, and the and the audience would just get into a frenzy waiting for him to to come on stage. But I found a quote from a from a biography of of his uh, from Oliver Helms, and the biography is named Franz Liszt, musician, celebrity, superstar. And he says, his facial expression and gestures, his clothes and the way he moved on stage, the glances he cast at the audience, it was all part of a great spectacle. Liszt was fully conscious of his impact on listeners and he controlled the mechanisms to perfection. And in this, in this same book, there's an account, um, you know, we spoke about the, um, the Berlin performance in 1841 and that was really, you know, that's when things started going and crazy. So here's an account of a person uh, after Liszt was departing from Berlin. A carriage drawn by six white horses pulled up outside his hotel and to the cheering crowd and, and to the cheering of the crowd, Liszt was almost carried away to the steps and lifted into the carriage where he took his seat between senior members of the university. 30 smaller carriages, each of them drawn by four horses and filled with students accompanied him as did a number of individual riders dressed in academic regalia. Countless other carriages followed and a crowd of several thousand seethed all around the departing travelers. So it was really, the, the Germans went just crazy for him, just absolutely crazy for him. And, but he, you know, he arranged for a carriage with six white horses to take him from the hotel. And that's how he, and that's how he traveled. He was, you know, he's quite, quite a character. But the transcriptions, the Schubert transcriptions, and this was around this time again, the Berlin performance was 1841 and, and the bulk of these Schubert transcriptions were written in 1838 and uh, 1839. And it was really, you know, he, he was fascinated with Schubert's leader and Schubert's leader, you know, at that time were not that famous, um, but he did, he, he wanted to show off these songs and as well as show off his technique, of course. Um, but I, I, have a, I have a passage from the musicologist Philip Friedman, and this is from a paper from 1962, the piano transcriptions of Franz Liszt. And he says, one must, one must question the necessity of a keyboard transcription in aiding the dissemination of Schubert's music. What effect could a, perform a piano performance of Der Doppelganger or Erlkenig have on an audience that did not know the original song? Yet both works are transcribed, including the recitative at the end of the latter. Once again, the piano performance must have been calculated for an audience that knew the original music. Interestingly, the transcription of Erlkenig, while completely free of added embellishments, is deliberately made as difficult as possible. This seems not so much to have desired to stimulate an interest in Schubert as to demonstrate his own ability to perform anything on the piano. It would seem that when this music was published, it was designed not to bring Schubert's music to the greater public, 
but rather to impress Liszt's admirers with his extraordinary keyboard technique. These works, like certain other early 17th century operas, were published primarily as souvenirs for the occasion. So it was really, he used them as a vessel, a vessel to show off uh, in, in these transcriptions. So I wanted to take a look at, um, at the Erlkenig. And we all, do we know the Erlkenig? Schubert's very, it's one of Schubert's most famous songs about the Earl King that's taking the child away, away from his, uh, from his father and, and takes him down, down to hell. So let's, I wanted to look at, at both, um, both scores. It's not let, allowing me to look at both of them simultaneously. Simultaneously. So here is Schubert's Erlkenig, and we're going to compare the same passage just briefly, just to see um, the music. But here, the Erlkenig for the pianist is a notoriously hard piano part because it moves so quickly. So it's very, very, it goes by and it just keeps going and going and going like that throughout the song. So you see this downbeat, two offbeats, two down, downbeat, two offbeat, boom, and, and just repeating and repeating and repeating. And here's a, a you know, in, and the theme is very simple here. He's just got, you know, quarter note, dotted half note, quarter note, dotted half, you know, it's very simple. And then he, he gives it a little bit of um, embellishment here in the tune, but it's very, very straightforward. But let's look at lists now. Can you see it side by side? The scores? No, the you can only see the list? Just the one, yeah. Okay, I, I thought so. So, so I, 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 oh, sorry, hold on. I, there we go. So I bracketed the same part. So here he has the, the he rolls in the right hand. These are all rolls for each of the notes. So it's the same notes, but then you see he's got chords in the right hand and he's rolling each ones with this, but look in the left hand, it's, it's impossible. Both hands are, are jumping like this, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. He, he didn't, just a simple figure with he's spreading the chord out in the left hand and, and at that tempo, it's extraordinarily difficult while doing these rolled, rolled chords in the right hand. It doesn't look like much on the page, but, but we'll see how, how it is when it's performed. And here's, look what he does in the, in the one part where Schubert embellishes it. He not only rolls it, but he does give you that embellishment on top of the, on top of the roll uh, of the chord in the right hand. It's, it's really, really incredible. It's really incredible. Um, I wanted to um, play some of this. I have, a, I, have a, I have a performance here on YouTube uh, by Evgeny Kissin of this, of this selection. So let's go to Kissin. And we will share a computer sound optimized video. Okay, here we go.
So I'm glad they showed his hands. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you see, even, even when it's straight and you see the triplets, blah, 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 the, the hand is just going constantly. It's very, very difficult. And then just adding these subtle embellishments, technically speaking, and you see the hand, his hands crossing mm -hmm. and, and all of that, all of that thing. It's it's you know. You can imagine. I mean, look, we're, we're looking at it. We're like, wow, look at that. Imagine what what that does to an audience and here in in seeing a, a virtuoso play like that. What do you think of Kissin? Am I wrong that um, the score is marked for the first part pianissimo, both in the right and the left hands, and uh, and he didn't choose to do that? Oh, I'm not sure. It's possible. Because he was playing, you know, all that right from the very start. He I think was. I noticed that it's um, that it's pianissimo marked that way. But it's, it's actually the, the the one section that I looked at. Yes, that was it was marked. It was marked pianissimo. It was actually three P's. He's he's um, he's wonderful. I mean, he's a really wonderful virtuoso. He looks very. When when was this? Because he looks well, very I, young here. I I wish I had that. He was a kid here. Oh yeah, he's 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 older now, but um, but he still has that hair. Uh, <laughs> so dramatic. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. But interestingly enough, the song sounds like Schubert's song. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really mess with, with much. He makes things a bit more complicated for sure. But the, the core of the song, he's not really being free with, with thematic material at all. It's the song and then he just makes it technically quite challenging um, for the pianist. But there are instances where he, he takes some more liberties with, with, the, um, with the music of, of Schubert songs. We heard it a little bit in the Ave Maria that I was, I was saying before we got on to David, where each, each statement of the tune gets more and more um, florid in the accompaniment, more and more, and just goes, goes really crazy. And, and, and in particular note, uh, the the um the Chopin song uh, that we heard tonight. He, I mean, he just added. You know, he went simply with the first statement of the song, and then he just added a billion notes. It seemed uh, to the end of that song. It was crazy. But I wanted to play um, another another Schubert uh, transcription uh, of a popular song um, that you should know, uh, Di Farella. You may not know it in another in incarnation, but uh, the Trout. Um, and again, we have uh, Mr. Kissin. Let's let's give a listen. Oh no! No. Here we go. Thank you. 
Just a minute. I think I'd like to hear them back to back with with, with, with the original Schubert, just to, just to, so I can compare them. Yeah, I mean, he adds so much more music to this. He has these transitions and these chromatic things, and um, uh, it's it's he's qu quite a bit more free uh, in this transcription with the with the with the material. This has anyway. more of a, a theme and variation variations uh, feeling to it, and uh, he, he he keeps that uh, that signature. Um, baseline that's characterized the trout. But other than that, he really goes, he really feels very free. And very free and, and adding, adding material to the song and in addition to the song, not just embellishing the accompaniment and, and highlighting that, that thematic material that David is, is, is referring to. It's a quite a different treatment um, than Errol yeah. Koenig. Yeah. What are your thoughts about about that about this one? I mean, we certainly know this tune. Well, it, it's wonder it's wonderful, you know, to hear it. It's a it virtuoso performance, but I think the the beauty of the original is almost in the simplicity of the the, the theme and the accompaniment, and that is uh, that's departed from here. And I'm not certain that's that it's it's an advantage for the song. I think that's an excellent point. Um, I, I think you know the, the the original song is there's quite a bit of charm um, to that song, and and that's some somehow missed here. Yeah. David, I'm glad you said that because I had the same feeling listening to the Schubert Ave Maria. I just thought, wow, it's such a beautiful, simple song, and and suddenly there's a barrage of notes <laughs> of <laughs> what? <laughs> right. Well, and as I, as I had said, it wasn't really about being true to the song. It was really about showing off his technique, these transcriptions. Yeah. Yeah. Derek, I think I have a, a related question. I don't know if you or anybody else on the, uh, the chat knows. I was wondering, listening to tonight's program, when the piano had basically evolved to the point where it was the piano that we would recognize today, because, you know, part of the fun I have sometimes listening to composers is imagining myself listening you know when people were first hearing like these works as originalities and you know I mean part of what list could bring like I agree with David and, and Gary that um, you know it kind of makes me appreciate the originals but um, but also I mean there, there might be something to be said for for these composers like taking these new instruments just out for a test drive and how interesting it must have been listening to them back when the world was just quieter. So yeah, I, I don't know when, you know, the piano kind of got to the, the modern piano that we all, that we all know. The modern piano as far, I mean, maybe I'm speaking out of school, was in existence by the time this piece was written, by, uh, by Liszt's time. Pleyel was the major, you know, um, innovator of keyboards and the transition from the forte piano to the modern piano is, is as I understand it. Anybody else? I, I, I think you're a little, Pushing that a little bit, Derek. I think it was later when Steinway introduced the steel strings and all that stuff was a little later. It was like the 80s and the 90s. Right. So the piano did not sound like a modern, anywhere near a modern Steinway when he was writing these things. Sorry, I was speaking more to the length of the keyboard and the use of, yeah. the, of the full the, keyboard. Yeah, that, that was fine. But, but the, the sound was substantially different when he was when he was composing. Certainly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can hear how he's utilizing. I mean, we talked about the extremities of the keyboard here, and especially um, in the in the Dante Sonata, um, in, a, in a passage that we'll look at as well. Um, you know, using using the keyboard um, just to the nth degree, he's using all possibilities of the keyboard. Which lead, which leads to the question of: Does anybody now, any contemporary player? use an 1840 style piano, or 1830, 1840. I know that we've, we've had a pianist, uh, Alexander Melnikov, who plays around on older instruments like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there, there, Gary, there are a lot of pianists who do that now, more than, more than in the last, in the last 10 years or so, 
been a lot of pianists who are playing on uh, not just you know forte pianos from the 20s, but later pianos, pianos from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, and you know, recording and Melnikov being being one of the most prominent. There's a there's hey, a museum. I'm sorry. Oh, say that name again. Alexander Melnikov. Melnikov. Okay. Melnikov. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's a, a museum or a I don't know if it's a factory or whatever outside of Boston. Do you know yeah. that place? Yeah. Yeah, What's it's a museum that they have um, something like 200 pianos from uh, the clavichord on on up to a Steinway. Right. But, um, and they have two or three musicians who come and play there every year and do concerts. And we've never been to one, but I've always wanted to go to one. But uh, I've heard recordings from there, and they're right. really excellent. Yeah, the, the singer, we had a young singer, Tom Melioranza, come to the series, and I believe he, which Schubert cycle, I want to say Vinterizer recorded up there. Sure. Um, yeah, so fascinating when things open up again. It's a, it's open to the public or is it not open? It to is, the it is open. To the yeah, public. I thought I think so. you have to make arrangements to go there. but Right, but certainly a, a neat place to check out. That's in, you know, a stone's throw of where we're at, so... Any other thoughts about the Schubert transcriptions? Your reactions are funny because that's the general reaction to <laughs> music lovers with list transcriptions. I mean, it's interesting. List list in in my circles gets knocked quite a bit. Um, as you know, a Derek, Derek, my my reaction is that when he when he fiddled around the least, they're the most charming and interesting and really beautiful. When he fiddled around the most. They become more about Liszt than they are about the original song, and they are about Schubert. They're just they're about they're about Liszt. Yeah, yeah. They sound like Liszt, like they're Earl King. The one you did just before Ave Maria was that to be sung on the water. Yes. Yeah, that that's a particular favorite of mine, and I I think he didn't mess it up too much, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Um, and then, then we move to the Dante Sonata. And um, I've spoken about this performance by Paul Lewis uh, in previous shows. It, it really just truly memorable uh, performance uh, of the Dante Sonata. And this piece, as I had mentioned, had its, had its origins um, as fragments uh, on Dante that he had written. And the story goes, it's, you know, and it's so funny. Uh, of the period, this romantic story of um, he was with Marie Dagu, and they were at a, at one of her homes in Lake Como, Italy. And there's a there's a Dante statue in Lake Como, and it was said that he and he and Marie were poring over Dante's Inferno, reading reading the reading the uh, divine reading the Divine Comedy underneath this statue for days and days, you know, just soaking in, soaking in the, the, the work, you know, which was a total fabrication. And, you know, and, and really, and honestly that, you know, that, that period was toward the end of their relationship and they weren't doing so well. And, and, and some musicologists say that there's a lot of this angst in this piece from it. Obviously he's, he's, he's talking about um, uh, Dante's Inferno <coughs> and things like that, but, but um, but it was just interesting to me that this, that that was the portrayal of the sonata that it was came about from this you know almost uh, in, you know divine inspiration from the statue um, from Dante. But um, so he, List List and Marie Dagu he 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 had an affair with with a dancer uh, in 1844 at which ended that relationship, uh, which is not and that relationship in his life was not that significant, but. His next relationship in 1847, um, this countess from Poland, um, Caroline Zutzein Wittgenstein, uh, is a very important relationship uh, with Liszt in his life. And it was she in 1844 that convinced him that he should be composing more. And he agreed and actually stopped touring to devote himself to composing. He still would perform occasionally, but he wasn't hitting the road constantly like he, like he did in these, in these previous years. Um, and he eventually, they, the two of them settled in Weimar um, where this piece was written, this, the reworking, the Dante Sonata was reworked in 1849 when they were in Weimar, but Weimar becomes a very important place because Liszt was 
hired as Kapellmeister there. And then Weimar became the center of that faction that I spoke of last week about that separate faction of Liszt and Wagner. Wagner got completely drawn to Weimar and Weimar came the center of this art music um, in the 19th century. So it's very, very important. Um, so Liszt embarks on this composition career um, and he gets smacked around a bit. Uh, Robert Schumann, I've got a quote from Schumann from the other faction, he says, this is from 1839. While Liszt developed his piano playing to an extraordinary degree, the composer in him lagged behind. This always leads to disparity, the consequences of which are felt in his most recent works. So he, he wrote that in, in a music journal. Um, but here's what Liszt had to say about his composing. Uh, a little bit long. However others may judge of these things, my works are for me the necessary development of my inner experiences which have brought me to the conviction that invention and feeling are not so entirely evil in art. Certainly you very rightly observe that the forms which are too often changed by quite respectable people into formulas, first subject, middle subject, closing subject, etc. He's talking about sonata form, older forms, may very, grow in, very much grow into habit because they must be so thoroughly natural, primitive and very easily intelligible. Without making the slightest objection to this opinion, I only beg for permission to be allowed to decide upon the forms by the contents. And even should this permission be withheld from me from the side of the most commendable criticism, I shall nonetheless go on in my own modest way quite cheerfully. After all, in the end, it comes principally to this, what the ideas are and how they are carried out and worked up. And that leads us always back to the feeling of an invention if we would not scramble in the rut of a mere tirade. So he's, he's sort of being defensive about not using the older forms and saying that, you know, I'm going on my own path and, I'm, and this is why I'm doing it. And it's not the methodology of spinning out the, the, what he refers to a formula of spinning out his ideas, but the ideas themselves and how he communicates those ideas to his listeners. So it brings us to the Dante Sonata and the, the title, and excuse me for my horrific French, Après une lecture du Dante, Fantasia quasi sonata. Read, uh, after a reading of Dante, a fantasy like a sonata. So the first part, there's a little bit of confusion. The Après une lecture du Dante is, is taken from a, a poem of Victor Hugo. Um, so there was question whether the piece was a program to that poem. And the answer is no, because when, when um, Liszt used generally poems uh, as, as a basis for program in his music, he would print the poem in the music. Like the Petrarch son sonnets that we, that we looked at last week, each sonnet is in the, in the, in the music. So that, that's not the case, but he borrowed from, from this poem. It was certainly taken from the title of that poem. And then the second part, it's very interesting. It's a fantasy quasi sonata. So I have a, I have a, a, a reading from a, a musicologist from uh, Cambridge University from 2008, David Trippett. He says, for Liszt and Weimar, the relationship between form and thematic transformation defined his connection with the music of the past. His agenda for compositional reform involved clearly advancing beyond earlier form so that it became possible to discern the stages through which the new form was gradually produced. The Dante Sonata offers a ready example in that Liszt symbolically inverted Beethoven's subtitle for the two sonatas, Opus 27, turning Sonata Quasi Una Fantasia into his own Fantasia Quasi Sonata thereby establishing a historic lineage for his music while at the same time loosening its ties with the classical conception of the sonata form. So he feels, he feels that this is Liszt sort of borrowing from the past and flipping it on, on its head, which I, which I found very, very interesting. But I wanted to take a look at the score quickly and go to the place where I referred to where the angels appear in these, in these tremolos in, in the, in the, in the um, high register. So here in the, in the tremolo and the andante, I wanted to play this just to give you a sense of what the performer is looking at when he or she is playing this piece. And I'm just taking Paul's 
uh, performance. And this is just basically the, the last couple minutes of, of, of the piece, starting from the Andante here. And I just wanted to play the music and follow around and follow the score. So here we go from this point. You see, and it just gets more notes, more chromatic, louder, faster, until it just, you know, and, and then the, it looks the simplest part of that of that whole passage looks easiest on the page. The when when this left and right hand are going da 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 all all these different things. But technically speaking, I mean that is you see how thick those chords are. It's almost as if the pianist needs 20 fingers to play all those notes constantly. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, think about, you know, we were talking in Beethoven about how Beethoven stopped caring about the performer and the performer's ability and pushed the boundaries of the performer. But this music, pushes boundaries. <laughs> Not many people, I mean, can play this, this piece that successfully as Paul did, it's because it's just, because it's that technically challenging. It's, it's really something that the, the performance was, was an incredible, incredible performance. Agree, yeah? yeah. <laughs> Preaching to the choir, preaching to the choir. 
I have, if you'll bear with me, I want to play one selection because I brought it up last week and I felt badly not playing it, but the Liebestrom, which is only about four minutes, the very famous Liebestrom to leave you this evening. So let's, let's give a listen to, and where is it? It is on YouTube. The Liebestrom, the very famous encore piece for pianists. And again, okay. Oh, no, 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 no. There we go. Again, we have Mr. Kissin. Here we go.
Beautiful. Yeah. Like I mentioned last week, that's the, you know, the rare occasion where he uh, transcribed his own song. Believe is strong. And you can see that, you know, there's a bouquet on the piano. There's a reason this, this, this is one of the, one of the go-to encore, encore pieces. Um, and was very, used to be very, very popular uh, years ago um, to play, to be played at recitals. I have, I don't think I've ever heard it live. Derek, you might be interested to know that the List B minor sonata was choreographed by Sir Frederick Ashton uh, for La Dame o Camellia or La Traviata. And that was, wow. I saw that on film many years ago. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I think it was Margot Fontaine. Any other thoughts tonight? Well, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll see you next week. We've got a show um, inspired by literature ending with the Mephisto Waltz number one with Manny X. <laughs> so uh, we'll see you next week. Take care, everybody. You Great too. show, Derek. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 So long. I really enjoyed it tonight again. Why did I enjoy it so much? <laughs>